Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB foundation level sample paper discussions where we are talking about the tips, tricks and time management related to the ISTQB foundation level examination. In this tutorial, we are still in the chapter 4 talking about the questions related to test techniques and analysis and let's continue further to discuss on what could be some more questions what we can expect from this particular chapter, however, a little theoretical one. So let's go ahead and quickly check on these questions today. The very first question we have is question number 24 and question number 24 is saying you run two test cases that is T1 and T2 on the same code. Fantastic. And test T1 achieves 40% coverage, that is statement coverage, and test 2 achieved 60% statement coverage. So at this point of time, we should have something in our mind that the question is related to statement coverage, and it should bring back all the knowledge from the tutorials that what we learned about statement coverage. Statement coverage is about the statements getting executed, not worried about the outcomes like true and false. Every single statement should be covered and there could be a possibility these tests uh, are trying to measure multiple different statements in the cup. What, what the question is, the question here says, uh, which of the following statement must be necessarily true about this particular achievement? That is one is covering 40% and another is covering 65%. So let's look at the statement because that's the only way we can come to the conclusion here. So option A says uh, the test suite uh, composed with these two tests, uh, that is T1 and T2, achieves 105% statement coverage. I think that's a very hypothetical statement because at any cost, no matter how many tests you write, you will test 100% statement as maximum. The reason is there's nothing called as 5% which is extra and where is it coming from? <laughs> right? Uh, a code gets covered that is 100% simple. It, it's not like something you're borrowing from someone else just to add a little more weightage to the coverage. So that does not make sense uh, at this point of time. This could be maximum at 100%, nothing more than that. Whereas option B says uh, that there exists at least one statement that must have been executed by both T1 and T2. That uh, pretty much makes sense because uh, I may have something common between these two uh, T1 and T2 because T1 is doing 40% coverage, T2 is doing 65% coverage. So it might be that T2 is covering a longer path than T1. So it is possible that they may have some common code between them for sure. That's one of the assumption. But let's cross check with C. C says uh, at least 5% of statement in the code under test are non-executable. Uh, Two things to understand here. Number one, uh, just the sum goes to 105. They are trying to inverse it and say 5% is non-testable. Uh, so that's wrong, right? We cannot do such inverse calculations. And second important thing, the statement testing is a technique to find out the test cases which give us the coverage, but never talks about non-executable code. It talks only about the executable codes, right? So both the ways, this option goes null and void in order to pick it up as the right answer. Let's check with the option D. Option D says uh, the test suite composed of test one and test two achieves full branch coverage. Uh, two things again, number one, the question is about statement coverage. So there's no relationship to that of the branch coverage. These are two independent techniques. And second important thing, we have learned 100% branch coverage guarantees 100% statement coverage, but not vice versa. So even if T1 and T2 is trying to achieve 100% uh, statement coverage, however, the scenario does not say that, it will not be necessary that it covers 100% branch coverage always, right? So that's not a mandatory statement. So I think that makes it pretty clear for us to understand. The right answer for this particular question is B, there exists at least one statement that must have been executed by both T1 and T2. Now, this is the level of attention to detail what you need when you are reading such questions because uh, a little bit here and there, and you may conclude saying that, yes, some of these 40, 65 comes to 105, but a little understanding would say, how can you go beyond 100? <laughs> Anyways, so that's pretty much to understand what could be the possible ways to deal with such questions. Let's go to the next one. The next question is question number 25, and question number 25 is again talking about the other friend of it, that is branch coverage. It says, let the branch coverage metric be defined as 
B cov, which means branch coverage, is equal to X slash Y, that is divided by Y, multiplied by 100, which returns me a percentage measure. What do X and Y represent in this formula? Context is given to you. You remember this from the slide, that there's a formula which we taught you, that branch coverage is measured as number of branches executed by the test divided by total number of branches uh, in the code multiplied by 100. So given that you remember this formula, this is how this can be asked to you, and you can straightforward conclude from here. But again, do not expect this to be very, very straightforward. They will involve some kind of twist and tricks as a part of it. So let's patiently read all the options here. Option A says X is representing number of decision outcomes exercised by the test. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, whereas Y, total number of decision outcomes in the code. Now that's a little interesting thing because uh, decision outcome is a conditional branch and for branch testing uh, x counts not only the conditional but also unconditional in simple word unconditional here simply means that when there is no node to be printed that means the false doesn't have anything to do but there's always a false out of a condition so true and false are two outputs which you will have and it's not necessary that false should do something every time so it also measures the unconditional and that's the slight difference between or hairline difference between branch and decision coverage so it's not about decision it's about branch however if you remember uh, in the tutorials i mentioned to you that branch has a synonym called a decision this could distract you so i thought of making it clear right here that uh, has a hairline difference and that hairline differences decision will cover the unconditional as well right and uh, sorry, will not cover the unconditional. So let's go with B. B says number of conditional branches exercised by the test cases. And again, total number of branches in the code. So Y is okay, but X is wrong. It is not just limited to conditional branches. It also covers unconditional branches. Okay, so the both applies here. If I go to option C, it says number of branches exercised by the test cases, whereas Y takes total number of branches in the code. Here, we are not talking about conditional as a keyword, so this can be taken pretty much with the, uh, all the branches which we're talking about, be it conditional and unconditional, whereas uh, option B was highlighting only the conditional ones, and that's where we go wrong, right? So let's go to option D. Option D says number of conditional branches. Again, I think if we have discussed on the option B, this is where we can stop reading the option D because it, again, repeats the same thing. So no matter whatever it is talking about, but... Uh, unconditional the conditional is not only the option which we cover that's decision right so i think uh, with that simple straightforward context uh, the right answer to this particular question is c that is x is representing number of branches exercised by the test whereas y is representing representing the total number of branches in the code which in the division multiplied by 100 gives me a percentage measure and that comes to the branch coverage so that's how sometimes things can, made, can be made simpler with having proper attention and detail to that. Let's move on to the next question. The next question is question number 26. And this says, uh, which two of the following statement provide the best rationale for using exploratory testing? Two important things to worry about. Number one, you have to choose two right answers whenever you see five options. That's the most important thing to worry about. And second important thing, what we need to think is the best. The word best uh, always uh, says that you may have something very correlative to each other and you will have to decide which one is the most appropriate compared to other options. So let's read the option in this case because uh, we cannot answer just by having the context of exploratory in mind. We have to read the option to conclude on that. Option A says here, Testers have not been allocated enough time for test design and test execution. This is one of the reason as time pressure, why would you prefer to go for exploratory testing? Because exploratory testing is one of the experience based test techniques and very much applicable when you have time pressure. So it's clearly talking about that, that you don't have enough time to do the executions. So I would choose to go informal testing. Option B says uh, the existing test strategy requires that the testers use formal black box test techniques. Of course, this is right opposite to the context given to you. Exploratory is an informal test technique under experience based testing, whereas the option B is trying to say that you're uh, having a strategy which is declaring that you should use 
formal testing under black box test technique. So they are contradicting and that's not the right answer, right? If I look at option C, option C says the specification is written in a formal language that can be processed by a tool. Then you, why don't you use formal testing or formal techniques? Because you have a formal requirement and the tool support is also available. So you can certainly minimize a lot of your, a lot of your effort being formal here. So there's nothing to go informal. So C is ruled out again. Let's go to option D. Option D says uh, testers are the member of an agile team and have good pro programming skills. Okay, that's really fine. It's really nice that testers know what is programming skill, but programming skill has nothing to do with the determination of whether to use black box or whether to use experience based. So this is completely out of the context. Okay, your programming skill does not help me to decide uh, should I go with exploratory or not. That totally depends on your past experience, domain knowledge, and knowledge of typical defects. Now we're left with one option, that is option E. Option E says uh, testers are experienced in the business domain and have good analytical skills. I think that makes it pretty clear that yeah, this is one of the options which can be chosen as the second opinion about exploratory testing. So put together, the right answer for this particular question are, that is A, testers have not been allocated enough time for test design and test execution. This would be a good option with respect to time pressure. And second is E, that is testers are ex experienced in the business domain and have good analytical skills, this would be very much supporting in terms of their basis. So that's how we can conclude with some of these type of questions, but judgment becomes very important and crucial. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning. Thank you.